Beneath this rugged crust of earth in our 49th state, Alaska, tremendous stress had built up miles below the surface. Stress beyond even the strength of a mountain to contain it. It was Good Friday on top of the world. With the earth still trembling, the Commander-in-Chief, Alaska, Lieutenant General Raymond Reeves at the Elmendorf Air Force Base, got through his report to the Department of Defense. An earthquake of 8.5 magnitude at 61 north, 174.5 west, has occurred, causing extensive damage in southern Alaska and seismic waves. The Alaskan Command has been in constant contact with Governor Egan, Mayor Chirac of Anchorage, and other civilian and civil defense authorities to determine what the military can do to assist in this disaster. The Alaskan Command is operational and capable of carrying out all assigned missions. People who lived in the Turnigan area of suburban Anchorage went down with their houses in a five-minute ride of terror over a buckling and surging earth. Modern apartments in Anchorage were left in shambles. In other communities, the damage was equally appalling. Seward, the vital rail link to the interior, was destroyed. Water supply was disrupted in many places. Highway systems with no alternate routes were knocked out. Harbors immobilized, such as Kodiak. At Chaniga, the native people suffered too. Their homes and a third of their number had been crushed or swept into the sea. All that was left for them to do was to bury their dead. On being informed of the catastrophe, President Lyndon B. Johnson declared quake-stricken Alaska a disaster area. He instructed Mr. Edward A. McDermott director of the Office of Emergency Planning to speed federal help for the Alaskan people. I flew to Alaska at once. The president's instructions to me were clear. He asked that I mobilize the combined resources of all federal departments and agencies for the monumental task of relief and recovery in Alaska. In addition to the authority of Public Law 875, our Federal Disaster Relief Act, the president wanted to be certain that all units of the federal establishment would draw fully on their own capabilities and their own statutory authorities in getting the massive effort underway. Upon landing at Anchorage, I saw widespread destruction, damage of appalling magnitude. But I saw something else, less tangible but equally important. The drive and spirit and determination of the Alaskan people was truly magnificent. In the midst of rubble and ruin, their only thought was to begin the long road back. Working in cooperation with Senators Bartlett and Greening, Representative Rivers and with Governor Egan, and with the respective federal authorities in Alaska, we quickly unified efforts to relieve suffering and restore essential facilities. The Alaskan Defense Command, Air Force, Army, and Navy, had immediately responded to the critical need for assistance in the stricken communities and was doing an outstanding job. I requested the Army Corps of Engineers to begin at once the gigantic job of disaster recovery, undertaking restorative work and emergency repairs to vital facilities. 
Also, the Coast Guard, Interior, Commerce, Agriculture, Public Health Service. In fact, all the federal agencies represented in Alaska lent their wholehearted cooperation with dispatch and effectiveness in providing needed assistance. The business of recovery got off to a fast start, but a long, hard road lay ahead. On receipt of my report, President Johnson requested from the Congress and quickly received the appropriation of additional disaster funds. Also, he promptly issued an executive order setting up a Federal Reconstruction and Development Planning Commission and appointed Senator Clinton Anderson of New Mexico as chairman to help guide the federal effort into channels that would speed recovery and help the state's development. Supervision of Army Engineers Reconstruction was given to the Alaskan District Engineer, Colonel Kenneth T. Sawyer, with authority to draw fully on Corps-wide resources. Defense Department, Alaskan Commission, and OEP officials helped to expedite the job. Problems besetting recovery of the great land were many. When the quake subsided, highly developed areas had come to rest as would a seesaw, with one end in the air and the other on the ground. At the one end of our seesaw, where land and sea bottom were elevated an average of seven feet, harbor breakwaters and piers were left high and dry. Shipping channels too shallow for navigation had to be dredged out. A nearby island was lifted several feet. Some harbors had little water left. At others, where the sea bottom sank as much as 10 feet, breakwaters had to be raised. Many Alaskan communities are squeezed between the mountains and the sea. Some are located on soils built up in layers of different kinds of material. Some safe, others treacherous when shaken by earthquakes. At Seward, unstable soil slipped into the sea, carrying railroad facilities with it. At Anchorage, much of the Turnigan subdivision was destroyed when an area resting on unstable soil slid toward Cook Inlet. Beneath this area were slippery layers of clay, which, compressed and dry, stands hard as a rock. But when wet and shaken, becomes soft and slippery. Raw banks now face Cook Inlet, subject even to more erosion. It became important in the quake-torn Alaskan communities to find out where the earth is stable and where it is not. Exploratory holes were drilled and soil samples collected. Members of the Alaskan Commission field team with Mr. Edwin Eckel of the U.S. Geological Survey, the team's chairman, investigated the problem. Mr. Eckel, we have been watching you and the consulting engineers at one of the drill rigs at the site. A sample of the clay that underlies the area was brought up and examined. The task force is basing its recommendations on the findings of these field examinations. These and the laboratory tests are developed by consulting geologists and engineers under the Army Engineers Program. The soil consultants are going to take some samples and send them down to Berkeley for possible testing to determine the effect of earthquake loading. They have an experimental model set up at the University of California and are going to try to recreate in the laboratory just what happened here. At the University of California, scientists and engineers working with Dr. H. Bolton Seeds simulated the soil beneath Turnigan and studied how it behaved during the quake. As the pendulum strikes the box, a miniature earth shock sets the layers of clay in motion just as the quake did beneath Turnigan. The colored layers represent the strata which test borings had shown to underlie Turnigan. There is a striking similarity between what the model revealed and the result of the earthquake at Turnigan. It took time to drill and study the soils under devastated communities. 
but it had to be done to reduce risk of future earthquake damage as plans went ahead for reconstruction. These findings resulted in moving one entire town to a safer location. Mr. James Bedingfield, Mayor Pro Tem of Valdez, describes this decision. And just as we did a moment ago by using the street for an office, we realized it would be necessary to move the town. Earth core samples have been taken, indicated, indicating that we are situated on unsound material, subject to further damage. The new town site will be located some four miles to the west, situated on a bed of solid rock. Meanwhile, with the assistance of these federal agencies and you people from the South United States, we are waiting to rebuild our town and port facilities. On the 4th of July, the Honorable M. A. Egan, first governor of the state of Alaska and his wife, visited Valdez. The governor commented on the morale of Alaskans and the assistance being given the people of his state by the federal agencies under the Office of Emergency Planning. The spirit, will, and determination of the people here and in all the other devastated areas that were so cruelly hit as the result of the March 27th earthquake and sea wave is something that causes all of us to be more proud than ever that we are Americans. We are also proud of the strong effort that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and other organizations are making in the reconstruction program. There are many, many problems. The most almost insurmountable cleanup problem, the construction of temporary water and sewage lines and other temporary facilities. Then the planning stages for redevelopment and reconstruction. All of these things take a tremendous amount of time. All of the organizations involved have cut out all of the red tape that is humanly possible to cut down the time element. And we are very hopeful that in a short time, many of the major reconstruction projects will be underway. Standing ruins left something more than an obstacle in the path of reconstruction. They were an attractive hazard to children. Collapsed apartments, demolished schools, and ruined homes were pulled down. Homes that could be saved were moved. Railroad cars were salvaged to roll again. Engineers studied damaged buildings in an effort to learn how to design and build structures that can better withstand earthquakes. One of the biggest cleanup jobs was the demolition and removal of several blocks of buildings that sank 10 to 15 feet on one side of 4th Street in Anchorage. With the removal of the debris, the site was filled in. Early restoration work was aimed at getting production back to normal. Fisheries, for example, are a mainstay of the Alaskan economy. Restoring the harbors was necessary to keep Alaska's fishing and canning industries going. Lieutenant General W.K. Wilson, Jr., the chief of Army Engineers, inspected a breakwater being raised at Kodiak to compensate for a subsidence of the sea's bottom. Restoring the vital rail link between the port of Seward, Alaska's principal year-round connection with the sea and the interior of the state before winter set in, was extremely important to recovery. At Seward, much of the land had slid into Resurrection Bay, and the seismic wave had littered the site with twisted rails, wrecked boxcars, locomotives, and boats. The Army Corps of Engineers has the job of rebuilding the devastated terminal facilities and rail connections. Major General W.W. W. Lapsley, North Pacific Division Engineer, checked out plans for expediting this task. The work includes dredging a deeper dockside ship channel. The Department of Interior's Alaskan Railroad, racing against the onset of winter weather and storm tides, undertook restoration of its lines. With trains rolling again, Alaska's interior was rejoined to the seacoast.
the state is restoring its highways with the aid of the U.S. Bureau of Public Roads of the Department of Commerce, another monumental task undertaken against the winter deadline. The earthquake changed the profile of the earth below and above the sea. The U.S. Geological Survey and U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey established new contours and recharted channels to aid navigation and harbor restoration. Alaska's construction season is short. There is a determination in the far north to beat the winter. Time is short to string overhead cables, to get water lines underground, and repair streets. Prompt availability of federal financing assistance helped to speed the restoration of private industries, businesses, and homes, and to undertake urban renewal. The 49th state is getting back into production. The tourists are returning. Another important Alaskan industry. Children are going back to rebuilt schools from makeshift classrooms. The native population, too, is being restored to self-sufficiency, helped by the American Red Cross. Director McDermott, in summarizing Alaska's response to disaster, said, we have had demonstrated again the cold fact that catastrophe can strike without warning at any time, at any place in our country with disastrous national consequences. But we have shown also in the coordinated federal, state, and local effort how effectively our free society can meet the challenge of disaster. Today, Alaska is well along the road to recovery. Its people look forward not merely to the restoration of what was, but to the creation of a new economy, perhaps even a new way of life in our 49th state. We cannot always control the angry forces of nature, but the spirit and substance of the Alaskan recovery effort will stand always as another great chapter in human progress.